All right, all right. All right. The podcast is cancelled. Thank you all for watching. Welcome to the No Cell Podcast. Today we have a very special topic for us to discuss. We're discussing how in the world have we gotten to three episodes? No, no, I'm kidding. It's uh, it's going to be the greatest wrestler of all time. Once again, I'm joined here by my co-host Omega, Kingdom, and Octo as we discuss who, in our opinion, is the greatest wrestler of all time. I'm going to let you start it off, Omega. You you, you jump right in with us. Well, well, you know what? I'm not even. I'm going to go last. Screw you. This episode's going to be a change. I'm going to be last. So- I volunteer Octo to go first. Octo goes first. Fuck that. You go, Kingdom. You, you've got the most like you. All right, so my pick for the greatest wrestler of all time. Now, you see... When I look at the greatest wrestler of all time, I, I look at the in-ring package and if they have charisma. And my pick for it is Eddie Guerrero. Because in-ring, he's got the he's got the whole package. He can strike with the best of them. Even shoot fighting, you know. I think it was Muhammad Hassan he fought with because like, he used the camel clutch and that was his father's fucking move that he created. So he just you know went off on him. But, you know, he would fucking tear you to pieces if you really, um, you know, crossed him. Technical ability, you know, he's, you know, in that breed of the Chris Jericho's, Kurt Angle's, Chris Benoit's, you know, those people that toured the world that put on classics after classics. And, of course, the high-flying, like, you know, he can, he can really do it all. Charisma, it took a while for the charisma to come out, but... Once he did in that 04 run, or even once he got to WWE, you know, he was just really entertaining. Like, his gimmick as well, the lie cheat and still, like, it's, it was so unique that, you know, for the time it was really entertaining, and even now it's so entertaining. A lot of people try to mo- uh, copy it, but they can't, because that's how good he was at performing it. And the third and final point that I got is his passion was unrivaled. The only person that could probably rival it you know, he's dead. And retracted. So yeah, there's my pick. Uh you know what? Personally I think Eddie Guerrero his the the, 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 the biggest thing about Eddie Guerrero is is I think he was kinda held back. I think that once WWE allowed him to shine and let him allowed him to, you know, take his character to the full length instead of keeping him down underneath all the big dogs on top. Like WCW did, he he flourished. He became a big star. So, yeah, I agree with DNA in this because usually, if people are, and I also think that I think Eddie Guerrero is very well known within the wrestling, the wrestling fans, but he is he doesn't really have that much of a mainstream knowledge. Sadly, due to the fact that he died an early death, but. As well as, uh, to follow up on DNA's point as well, I do agree with him in the fact that the WWE did hold him down for very a very long time to the point where, really, he had, he had a really good run at, like, 2002 to 2006. And that yeah, was no. really the only noticeable run of his career, other than his whole thing with China. Uh, I, I just want to point out that... Um... It really was a shame that he passed on so early because I do believe he could um, do really well in the mainstream. Media. Like he would probably transit, he would definitely transition well in the movies. Like I, I think his personality and his as their charisma, people would just 
fall in love with him like they do the rock and Cena, like well, in the I, movies. Well, I think if if Eddie was still alive, he would definitely be like one of the head trainers of the uh, performance center. He would help the yeah. young guys build them up and all that when he's done with wrestling, which I actually think that he's the type of guy that wouldn't be like going overboard. He would only wrestle maybe up until 2015 and then retire and then go into to, agency and that. To be honest, I mean, the, the, the performance center has run a little bit, uh, in my opinion, not run that well because they are training people just WWE style over there. And I feel like this could... I. I, I don't know Eddie Guerrero personally, but I just feel like how does he wrestle? Like sometimes he would just, you know, like you said, he's a very charismatic guy. Uh, you know, he improvised a lot during his matches, I presume. So I would just feel like he would hate WWE style nowadays. So I can't, I can't really picture him in that fucking role. I don't, I don't think, I think if Eddie had lived, well, he died in like 2007. Yeah, 2007. He, or yeah, he died in 2005 and Benoit died too. Let's say. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry, what was it? 2005, and he passed. Okay, Eddie passed away in 2005. I think I think if Eddie had. If he hadn't passed away, he would have probably retired by 2010 at the very latest because Eddie had already been in the business for like 20 years by that point. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't think he would have to actually deal with the modern day WWE style. And and here's the thing, he wouldn't have because like if he doesn't die, I, I doubt Benoit would have done what he did. So that that style, that hard hitting gritty style, might possibly still filter. If anything, it might even be, um, you know, it would keep the high flying and the, you know, indie stuff today. But you know, you probably still have that. You know, you would have two great teachers in Eddie and Benoit to where a, everything would have been more. Well, there's a possibility that that WWE style may not exist today if Eddie exactly. Guerrero had had been put into a position to train these these young pups the right way instead of just mass produce them out the door and they're all the, they're all generic and the same. Yeah, like he he would have put the wrestling into it, whereas it now it's just entertainment. Even that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like sadly, because of his early death, all we can do is just think of that maybe potentially what he would have done because who and knows for, for that reason is why he is my greatest of all time <laughs> yeah i don't know what uh i don't know what they call this style today it, guy jumps off the top rope does like 30 it, it's called garbage that's what it's called today just do everything do everything don't worry about it there's no reason you did it get right back up after you do it means nothing but you did it. And here's the participation trophy. All right, let's move on. Uh, Octo, your choice for greatest wrestler of all time. So I looked at the full package side of things. So you have to be, in my opinion, to be the greatest wrestler of all time. You have to be a great promo. You have to be a charismatic fella. You have to be a good man inside of the ring that I actually want to watch. And so I've chosen, and to me, there's like no one better here. Like you can have your, you know, th there's guys out there who can, who are arguably better than my pick inside of the ring, for example, like guys like Shawn Michaels is considered one of the best wrestlers of all time. And the Undertaker is considered one of the best wrestlers of all time. But my guy, in my opinion, has the total package of like, you know, everything. And that is the nature boy, Ric Flair, who, if you think about it, is like the full embodiment of like what a pro wrestler is. Like when you see him just do anything like in the ring, outside of the ring, you cannot turn away. Like you cannot just say, OK, here's this guy. I just don't I just do something else. I'm just playing on my phone or whatever. No, when he comes on, you want to watch. You want to watch. And especially when he was a wrestler, there was no phones around so of course everybody paid attention to him uh, could, could you imagine in rick flair's prime all the shit that he'd get trending for <laughs> i i indeed can imagine that uh, there would have been some nasty things probably but uh yeah one of the things that i just adore about rick flair is you know nowadays a lot of people just you know they play characters like 
Seth Rollins is getting called the Architect for whatever reason. You know, Dean Ambrose is getting called the Lunatic Fringe for whatever reason. Uh, Roman Reigns is getting called the Big Dog, you know, for whatever reason, because they want to brand people. But Ric Flair, he's not a character, in my opinion. This guy is just basically Richard Flair, just turned up to like a 10 when he's in the ring. And I've, I mean, I have not seen him. As, as, uh, I mean, when I, w I, I started being a wrestling fan, like I said, in 2010. So at that point, Flair was like retired for like two years in WWE. So, but uh, I didn't watch TNA at the time. So, um, but I rewatched a lot of Ric Flair stuff, and it's just impossible to not have him in your like, like if he's not your number one pick as the greatest wrestler of all time, he's a, probably at least in the number five in the top five list of the greatest wrestler of all time. No, uh, um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you on that stance of, you know, if, if he's not number one, he's got to be at least number, like, on the top five. To me, he's, like, top three of greatest of all time. Um, I would say, because if you think of, like, yeah, I think there's a difference, uh, of total packages for people. Like, for them, it, you know, there's people... Yeah, for example, for you, Octo, it's on the, you know, professional side of, like, the on what you see on TV, you know, the promos and in-ring and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, and I'll explain to this with my uh, pick at the end. Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's also about, like, the outside, you know, what did they do for the business other than just for themselves, you know, how did they give back and what did they do? And there has been cases of Ric Flair playing politics, getting his way. I mean, WCW was an ex a very much of an example of that where Rick was booking all of his own stuff and like booking himself really high up. Um, and also I would think like, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of wrestlers that gets criticisms for this and you know, yeah, you know, Triple H would get criticism for this. Uh, yeah, you know, Undertaker would get criticism for this and all that sort of stuff. And that is like staying longer than what you should have. And I, th to me personally, I think Flair was one of those guys that like after two thousand and three, he should have been done. From like yeah, and then yeah, he retired quote unquote in two thousand eight came back, continued to wrestle, then retired again at 2013, I think it was, in TNA? I think, uh, yeah, no, 2010, I believe, but, like, um, the the one thing about Flair is, like, okay, like, I, I think the Evolution run was fine enough, and then, like, his last two years or so, they were basically nothing anymore. Like, I think... His second to last WrestleMania, he was wrestling on the pre-show and had an yeah, attack team with exactly. Kalido. Exactly, and, and that was just it's like, terrible, you know? It's like sad, you know? I mean, you, you can definitely see that Vince has like nothing with this guy anymore, which is sad. Like, that, that is really that is really, you know, just confusing to me how you can have nothing for fucking Ric Flair. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is also just how WWE just used him, basically. And I realize... Flair at the time was already in his early 50s and, you know, but he was still, I mean, I, I would still rather watch Ric Flair than guys like Kalido and Shelton yeah, Benjamin. Yeah, like 100%. And guys like that. Yeah. Or, or people who were pushed at the time, like who were pushed? Bobby Lashley in 2007. Fuck that guy yeah. and, at the, around that time, you know? So I realize you have to, you know, but you, you know what Vince wants in the top guy. Like, I, I, pr I, I presume... I presume that Vince McMahon actually respects Big Rick sweaty Flair. man. Yeah, he likes big sweaty man, but I, I, I presume he likes Ric Flair and he respects the guy. Yeah. But uh you know, this and yeah, I don't yeah. I don't even know what I was going with this person. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Like a question for you. Like I've watched I've watched quite a bit of Flair, but not a hunt like so much. Would you know if there's been any case of Flair? passing like uh like sort of helping out the young i mean evolution is one of them 
Randy and uh, Batista helping them mm. up with rising in the like main card and all that sort of stuff. Are there any others in that sort of spectrum? Well, where he's like, well, oh, Rick did bring. Rick did bring up like the the Andersons and um, JJ Dillon yeah, into prominence, and he tried bringing up you know ben, same same thing with uh, the Benoit and um, Pillman. Yeah, in, Benoit and Pillman too. Yeah, I, I I I think that's more of a victim of like you know. Here's my here's my here's, well here's my problem with the idea of Ric Flair being the greatest of all time because though Ric Flair. Without a doubt, on the mic is phenomenal. Ric Flair as a character is phenomenal. Ric Flair, even even athletically in the ring, especially in his early days, was phenomenal. However, Ric Flair has only ever been as good as the guy he's wrestling in the ring. That's true. I actually would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, about... he he's not a ring general. Right. I, no, that's true. I, the one thing I have to give, like guys like Triple H or The Rock or Austin or even even guys like uh, Sergeant Slaughter, you know, these are guys who could go out there and call a match. They could they could have a match and they could lead the match. And Rick was only ever as good as the guy in the ring because he would follow the match and. Insert his little Rickism deals. The, the think, you know the flip over the top rope and run. D- damn it, Ricky Morton. Yeah, I think that was the reason why. Like for when when you when you watch a Ric Flair match, for like eighty percent of it, he gets his ass kicked. So yeah. <laughs> like and and let and, yeah. and and there's no one better in my opinion who gets his ass kicked than Ric Flair because he does it such. Oh, yeah. You know, no, he's so just standing way and everything. Let's take someone else who let's take someone else who is only as good as the guy they're in the ring with, right? Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Put you this this is why Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan like why it was so hard to get them into a match together. Because they're both followers in the ring. Like they're reactors. They react to what's going on in the ring. They don't really they're not really ring general. Yeah. Uh, they just they just have their gimmick and they do their gimmick. Otherwise, they're they're kind of lost in the ring. I I will also say this with with Flair. Flair is a one sided wrestler. What I mean by that is he's only as he's only good when he's a heel. If he's a face, he's he's not he's not good. Like he he's very less charismatic because he, yeah. That isn't the flair that we all know. The flair we know is the rich guy that's going to fucking bribe. It, 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 I would disagree it, 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 on it, it, one point. It, it, I would disagree on one point when, when, if you remember that one segment we just spoke about, uh, Kalido, <laughs> there was like one segment on a Raw show where he, uh, Kalido was leaving the show, like in storyline, mm-hmm. and like before the show was over, and Ric Flair came along and said, "What are you doing?" And he said, "I'm going." Like I want to go with Tori to the bar or whatever, yeah. and then you fucking tore this guy a new asshole <laughs> by just saying this is why you guys are never the main events. Just oh, leave. You don't give a fuck oh, about you, the main events. Yeah, like the yeah. only thing that to me was a really good, not even really good, but just an all right face run was his last run in WWE when it was the whole "if I lose, I have to retire" thing. No, he he had a good run as a face when he was opposite of Vince McMahon at right like right after WCW. Oh yeah, yeah. And I think he was also a good face like against Triple H briefly after uh, Evolution split. Yeah. In Go Five, although that was a bit more brief than the other two. Yeah, I think it. I think that people had this idea of Ric Flair to where he could be the only guy in the business that could cheat and get cheers. Maybe him and Eddie. Yeah, that's it. Like, it was only people love to see him do it. And and Eddie was a fucking Eddie was great. Yeah, I, I, I think Eddie, I think Eddie did it way better because he was in your face and made it almost comedic, but he he, he pulled it off much better than Rick would. Well, the thing yeah, is, I, is that Eddie like Rick, Flair did it in a heel way. Eddie yeah. did it in a face way. A face you know, way. I'll put it this way, right? I'll yeah. put it this way. Look, Eddie was a little more creative with this shit. 
um, Ric Flair, it was always the same deal. You know, he'd poke you in the eyes or he'd give you a low blow or something like that. You know, classic heel stuff. But yeah, uh, Eddie, Eddie, one time he like picked up a chair and then like, and, and, uh, and he hit the mat with it and then he fell over. And so when the ref got up and it, his opponent was getting up, the ref assumed that his opponent hit him with the chair because the guy stupidly picked it up and then he gets disqualified and Eddie wins. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Or even not stupidly picks it up, but just like throws it at him and he has to catch it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he'd do some shit like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, DNA, do you want to do your... Uh, let's see. Well, I, I'm if I'm gonna pick who I think is the greatest wrestler of all time, I've got to go old, old school. Because in my opinion, the greatest wrestler of all time is none other than the superstar, Billy Graham. All Billy right, Graham. Billy Graham in the in like in his heyday in the ring, he was. The standard. He, his 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 physique was amazing. His work in the ring was top notch. His interviews were the stuff of legends in this day. And this is literally the guy that Hulk Hogan and Jesse Ventura both ripped off for their gimmicks. So and, you look at, and, and not to mention, like he had high esteem among uh, his peers. The fans loved him. You know, whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, they still fucking loved him. And let's not forget and let's not forget that he advised Kofi Kingston to take some steroids to be an actual main eventer. As Kofi Kingston should have. He was skinny as a fucking rail. All right. Mr. Graham was just looking out for his best interest in in the wrestling industry. <laughs> God damn it. Okay, uh, hey. You know, you know, you know, he's just being honest with the guy. He says, listen, Kofi, all right, you're a great, you're a great athlete, all right? You're doing, you got a great gimmick, you got a great look, all right? You, your mic work needs a little, little, you know, little touch up here. But I'm going to give you the secret to really getting over in the WWE. Here, take these steroids. <laughs> you know what he should have done? He should have said, they're not steroids, they're Tic Tacs. Yeah. <laughs> like, them. Take these Tic Tacs, they'll make you bigger. I mean, I would either have to go with um, Billy Graham or possibly even Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes was just like, yeah, he got over, you know, looking, looking like he did. I mean, you, we've all seen Dusty Rhodes. Yeah, I don't yeah. think the guy. The guy was he he, he simultaneously <laughs> portrayed this character of uh, you know son of a plumber and you know just a regular. Yeah, I don't know how to play. He he played he 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 kind of had the role that Steve Austin had later on, where he represents the everyman standing up against the oppressive, you know, fucking commissioner or whoever the hell's in charge. That was his gimmick. Yeah. So I mean, either one of those I would go. They're both. Uh, I don't know that Dusty was the best wrestler in ring, I guess far, but he. He uh, he definitely had the fans on his side. They loved him. The fucking fans loved him. Yeah. Um. Hmm. We don't have too many arguments for Dusty, because I mean, Dusty was Dusty, you know. He like like you said, he wa he wasn't the best in the ring, but he was a guy that was iconic in his own way. And also, he was one of the rare guys back in the day that was sort of like a fair booker when he was doing the WCW thing. Um, uh, I think some people will tell you otherwise, like in the 80s. Well, if that's the uh, case, then yeah. He was known for, you know, pushing himself. I mean, so. Dusty, was, Dusty was basically ROM. You know, he comes up with any crazy idea that comes off the top of his head, he's fucking doing it. Oh, okay then, well... I, I, I haven't really been following much of Dusty's career, so I apologize for the not factual information on that, but um... Well, it, interesting, interesting little fact, um, the character Virgil, I'm sure you all remember Virgil. 
Yeah. Right. The the butler to uh, Ted DiBiase. He was called Virgil because that was Vince McMahon's way of ribbing on Dusty Rhodes, whose real name is Virgil. Right. Uh, so when the the guy who played Virgil went over to WCW, they called him Vincent. <laughs> Because they were ribbing on Vince. So, so does that mean uh, Terry, like Terry Runnels, is like a, a rib on Hulk Hogan? Because Terry is Hulk Hogan's real name? Nah, I don't, I don't think that's connected. Oh, it could be. Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? We'll have to ask Vince. I mean, we, we're going to have to get Russo on the phone. Wasn't it worth I didn't know that. Wasn't Virgil also called Shane in his late le- late WCW run? I, I believe he was. I have no idea. I wasn't watching WCW at that time because it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Oh god, nah. But I, I'd say with the um, ah, uh, this is probably very dis- Who was the f- who was the first one you said uh, for greatest? I keep forgetting his name. And that and that's actually one of my points. Billy Graham. B- Billy Graham. Yeah, I think it's just because of how long ago it was. He hasn't really like now in today's world. There's no real. Yeah, no one really knows him unless you you know your wrestling history, which let's be honest, out of the fucking millions of wrestling fans, only like a fucking ten thousand people know their fucking history. <laughs> when it comes to the the wrestling world. Well, most people are Fairweather fans anyway. They're not actually into wrestling. They're just into WWE. Yeah, well, that's true. You know, that's going to be a fact anyway. But um, I'd say that's probably one of the bigger things on him. Um, like, I mean, Bill, keep in mind, Billy Graham helped build the business that would become WWE. You know, he was a big star in Vince McMahon Sr.'s promotion. He helped he helped set the foundation. He helped grow the 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 company that would become eventually WWE. Without Billy Graham, there is no you know, there is no Bray Wyatt. Without Billy Graham, there is no uh Kofi Kingston. There is no CM Punk. There's no John Cena. There's maybe even no Hulk Hogan. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I can give you that. Yeah, alrighty, boys. Alrighty, so. Well, it's finally, me. it's your turn, Omega. You're going to enlighten us as to who you think yeah, the exactly. greatest wrestler of all time happens. And why, and why it is Crowbar. Because no, the crowbar. Why, why is David playing with a crowbar? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, you know, crowbar. He's got a he's got a thing called a crowbar. It opens gates. Um, people can't open gates. GG. No, it opens heads. Yeah. We all we all know that you're a fan of uh, Gilberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, when I see those sparklers, oh my and, god! And, and his older brother Goldberg. Yeah, no. All right. So, for me, for the closing, I guess, suggestion and an opinion on who I believe is the greatest wrestler of all time, I have to go with, and as sort of what Octo was saying, you know, I like, when I think of the greatest of all time, I think of the complete package, and that means inside and outside of the ring. I think if you're truly, you know, what you do to give back to the business, what you do for the boys backstage, how you help the younger talent go up and create their own careers and such. So I, for me personally, the greatest wrestler of all time for me is The Undertaker. Now, you want to, like, we can start from even the beginning. I mean, the gimmick itself is... I believe universally agreed as the greatest gimmick in wrestling. I mean, for for nah, that's that's man tower. Yeah, but for someone, and and it's the thing. There are many wrestlers with many great gimmicks, but those gimmicks never had. They had some risk, but not to the risk of what the Undertaker is. 
you're talking about a guy who is a zombie who's supposed to be dead, who's able to shoot lightning out of his asshole and able to constantly die and fucking resurrect himself to wrestle other people. And yet for 30 plus years, The Undertaker has both carried that gimmick and made it probably one of the most popular things in wrestling. I mean, from straight from the day one when he arrived, pe- there were children scared shitless of what this guy looked like. And throughout this entire time, he was able to not only hold the gimmick and keep it like fresh in people's mind, but by doing that, he used, he was reinventing it. And that was one of the key things about The Undertaker is that his ability to reinvent. Uh, reinvent his uh, gimmick you have to think of the different eras the undertaker's been a part of the golden era the new generation era of Shawn michaels and uh bret hart the attitude era of stone cold steve austin and the rock ruthless aggression the pg era and also what is today which would be called i guess the re re uh reality era My the retarded era yes retarded yes I guess so. The retarded era. Um, well, here comes the cancellation. Yeah. Or 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 WWE's words, it would be the new era version free or something like that. Yeah, for oh, only nine ninety nine. Rock who just got us kicked off the fucking air. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. But um, you know, I mean, and the, these some of these changes were were minor, where it came from the dead man uh gimmick to. You know, the sort of Lord of Darkness gimmick. And then some of them went major. Uh, the Ministry of Darkness, where The Undertaker was sacrificing wrestlers into joining his cult. Where he would drink the blood of, what was it? It was... Um, see, see that, that's where Emma uh, was losing fucking traction. They need yeah. to sacrifice people yeah, more. Yeah, that, that's what, uh, look, at a certain point, it just starts getting ridiculous. Yeah. I'm going to take over the World Wrestling Federation with my demonic but... powers by doing choke slams <laughs> you, and you, you, may, you may say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But you may say that, but that was one of the hot, like, hottest things in the wrestling era at that time. In the 90s, that was one of the major draws. Well. It was so hot that he wrestled Big Boss Man at WrestleMania 15. Yeah. I like, but, I like how they just I like how they kept escalating it like like at one point he used to come out with a body bag he put him in a body bag and then, and then they started then he started putting him in caskets and then it went from caskets to sacrificing them on altars to, to yeah the, to but, the higher power um, <laughs> what next he's gonna steal people's credit cards alright but um and then he went, then he went to the big like bigger change where. He had, a, he had a, I believe it was a shoulder injury. Oof. And he decided to reinvent himself yet again, but to the extreme at this point, which was what was known as the American Badass gimmick. Which, I mean, you're talking about a complete switch. This went from a dead guy to an alive guy who drove a motorcycle. And he got that over. Like, to... The credit of Mark Calloway and his ability to actually hold that like white hot push from and gravity from the fans on such a gimmick is over is incredible that no one else has ever done. And then to top that, he decided to go back into the dead man gimmick and it still worked. And that's just for the reinvent like reinventing of his character. I mean, again, longevity. I don't think you can really name a single wrestler who's been, you know, not only wrestling for 30 years, but wrestling constantly on a main event level. I mean, take the only, like, side thing you could say is his, um, sure, some of his feuds, um, and, like, the tag team, uh, division. But other than that, it was either main event quality, like main event feuds, or it was quite simply just a title, uh, title feuds with people. Yeah, I don't think there's been any wrestler that's actually held to that standard for that long. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, 
yeah I'll, I'll give you that that he you know for i mean close to 30 years he was always yeah he was in the main event scene and he was you know he in was the definitely latest, in the second the, half of the show yeah always. and the last in the last 10 years he, well, he would only like wrestle maybe three times a year or so but you know that was because of all of his problems and everything yeah no, now 100%. When, now when we discussed rick flair you said that your pick is a guy, for example, that gave to the wrestling business, and he gave a lot to the wrestling business. That's true, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why this came into my mind currently. But when DDP joined WWE, like for whatever reason, something happened with him, and he became the Undertaker's wife stalker. And if you remember his debut, I believe against the Undertaker was just a fifty-minute. 50 minutes of ass kicking by the Undertaker it was just one fucking sided thing. But do, but uh, yeah, well, but, that, that's what he happens when he stalks someone else's wife. All right, all right. <laughs> but but if you've actually uh, also listened into the interview with DDP, is that he completely understood why it was because these were the guys that were like running WWE out of business for 58 weeks straight. And we're gonna almost destroy the company. So when Vince finally bought WCW, and that's the thing, it wasn't. I wouldn't say it's Taker's. Like Take, I don't think Taker was solely going to be like, yeah, I, I want to squash these kids. I think it was more of a Vince call. And I think because of Taker's loyalty to Vince, like he sided with him just for the simple fact that these guys were trying to run. Vince McMahon, Undertaker, and the rest of the WWF boys out of business and out of a job. So I think after that yeah, stage... Yeah, but the, was... the, the invasion thing is one of the key points why, you know, it was a long, slow build for the low ratings that we have nowadays. Like, when you watch, like, the two weeks after WrestleMania 17, like, they lost so many goddamn viewers. Like, when the Monday Night Wars and the Raw lost so many viewers, and but that, is so that invade. but is that a booking fault or is that like is that an under, Undertaker's fault or is that Vince McMahon's fault? I mean, you said like Undertaker fell loyal to Vince. Like, I mean, the the invasion angle is is known as the most fucked up storyline of all time because of you know you you can say it was Vince's ego and you know presumably he said to Undertaker. That uh, you know you have to beat up this DDP guy, but Undertaker probably at that time already had a stroke that he could have probably say, no wait a minute Vince that doesn't make sense like you know this guy DDP is a former world champion like why in the hell are we treating him like a geek here like immediately like he was immediately a geek like he was just destroyed at the first time he gets in the ring with the Undertaker it's like can you not give this guy a little bit. So, I mean, but, you know, that's, like, one thing that just came to my mind. Like, it's not like he has a track record of this bullshit, you know, but yeah. that, that's what, just one thing that came into my mind. Yeah, I gotta agree. That that The way that they treated DDP was pretty shitty. I mean, you, you bring him in as a stalker, really? I Like, like what are you, one step above bringing DDP, the pedophile? Yeah. Oh, no! He yeah. was molesting your kids, Undertaker! Now yeah. beat him up! I mean, come on, man. Like, yeah. what kind of ridiculous shit is that, dude? Like, like, um, it doesn't even make, it doesn't even make fucking sense. Like, DDP was this high energy, positive, you know, uh, cocky world champion in WCW, and all of a sudden he gets obsessed with Undertaker's wife. And, what? Yeah. I, who, was not, who was not even, who was not even hot, you know, that's another yeah. thing. But, um, anyway, but, so. Yeah, but that, that, yeah. that. That's neither here nor there on Undertaker, but yeah. uh, I, I, you know what? I'll be honest with you. If somebody, if they were to, if WWE were to say, we are going to, you know, we're going to place Undertaker as the greatest wrestler of all time in our Hall of Fame records or whatever the fuck, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be upset with that at all. Yeah. I, I say, okay, you know what? I, I, I'm that's fair enough because yeah. the guy has put in. His blood, sweat, and tears for 30 years. He made every iteration of his gimmick successful. He has been in the main event spot. He has been a leader in the backstage. Like, he is he is the pinnacle of what a professional wrestler should be as far as in and out of the ring. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I can't. I really, I can't be mad. And at that. I, I even think like even in ring ability, sure he wasn't a Shawn Michaels, but to me personally, I think Undertaker was really the first guy that like revolutionized what big men can do in the ring. Like I also would, I also would advise to new people that get into wrestling. If you want to learn how to run the ropes, watch Undertaker matches. That oh, guy yeah. is, that guy does rope running like it's an Olympic sport. <laughs> no, exactly. You know, um, but you know, like he was the first guy, the big guy who, like, able to climb the, you know, climb the top rope, walk amongst it, jump over it, all that sort of stuff. That really reinvented what a big man can do, and Taker was sort of taking care of all of the big men. I mean. He was practically Big Show's mentor for the nineties, trying to tell him what and what not to do. Uh, he was mentor. He was personally mentoring both Kennedy and M- M- MVP. Uh, and he helped out our boy Nathan Jones. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and he was he he did you know he kind of did hang around and mentor guys like Yokozuna and uh, well, he would be later be known as the Godfather. Yeah, Tom Mustafa or yeah, whatever his name on. was at that time. Yeah, uh, I think he was Papa Shango. I think at that point, maybe, maybe, maybe that was it. Um, but uh, like you know, and I think personally that, well, one like there are three people that I really think, other than maybe a couple of people that helped them out, really got their career elevated to the next level because of Taker. Randy Orton, Batista, and Edge. Those feuds really helped those three guys develop into main event status. I mean... Uh, I, w- I would throw Cena and uh, Brock Lesnar into that. Oh, Brock Lesnar, yeah, 100%. Like, Taker carried Brock Lesnar's career in 2000, like, two. You know, 2002, 2003... I mean, if you look at even the statistics, I mean, what, Taker is 1-5 in in pay-per-view matches against Brock because he's constantly pushing him. And then, of course, at the end, he uh, gave Brock the streak, which, to me, I think is the smartest decision. We can maybe have a conversation about that in another episode. Well, Vince gave Brock the streak. I think think that Taker... I think... I honestly think Taker was the only reason that Sid Vicious got over in WWE. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, like we said on the previous in the, podcast in the late, episode. In the late 90s. Yeah, like that's the only thing I can remember from Sid Vicious is that that one WrestleMania match with <laughs> Undertaker. And again, that's another thing, the streak. You know, I mean and people may be like, "Oh, what it what about you know, it, it would it had to be because of Taker and not wanting to lose and that. No. There's been like I believe three or four times that the idea came around and even Taker was considering to drop the streak, but his opponent would refuse to lose out of respect. Or, like refuse I don't think to they, win. Out of I don't respect. think they I don't think Vince even started like recognizing that he that Taker had a streak until like after WrestleMania. 12 or 13 18 yeah 18 18 it was yeah because like he, like, they were like oh you do know you're 10 and 0 now right right yeah. so i was like but um yeah like you know there's the story of like it was originally going to be booked for randy orton um but randy orton out of respect did not want to lose uh did not want to win sorry against taker and let him uh out of respect, I don't want to lose to you, old man. Yeah. I, I, per- I personally don't. I personally don't think anybody should have won the streak. I should have beaten the streak. Yeah. And but... if it was, it, if it was going to be somebody, it should have either been Edge or Andy, or Randy Orton. Let, let, let's we'll, we'll save that convo and we'll throw it to maybe next episode of the episode after because that'll be a good discussion. Um. Right. And yeah. So I think overall gimmick, in ring ability, even promos, prom- uh, like Taker has dealt with The Rock and Stone Cold on promo offs, and to my opinion, you have won a couple of those. Um, backstage, I mean, WrestleMania fourteen. Yeah, second your sister say what? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, WrestleMania fourteen. Let's be honest. Uh, we could, we may, we may not have had like Austin winning the like winning the belt properly 
at WrestleMania 14 if it wasn't for Taker being backstage and taping his fist. Um, yeah, there, there's so many factors that I just think that is the genuine reason why I believe ta- The Undertaker is the greatest wrestler of all time. I can't be mad at that. Okay, I honestly can't be mad at that that decision. That's, that's uh, you know, if if maybe second to my own choice. Yeah. Taker also, would be second. Just just a predict. It's a prediction that I really want to happen. Undertaker, and this is my opinion. Undertaker should be. Uh, if Undertaker goes to the Hall of Fame, it should be a single Hall of Fame inducted show, of just Undertaker. Like what they did with Andre, because that would be an incredible and just, show. And just do, do it in a um, empty arena. <laughs> no, but like I can just see with the career that Undertaker's had, there could be so many people doing speeches about Taker, and they do it like the Andre one, which I think would be deserving. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, oh well, as a as a um. As an aside, I'm going to leave the audience and leave you guys out there in the comments section uh, a little question. Let me get your feedback on this, and maybe we'll bring this up in a later episode. The ti- the purpose of the title, is it to elevate someone to the next level, or is it to signify that they have reached the next level? Now, we can look at this from many different ways. If you put the world title on someone... That's supposed to signify that they are now stepping into the world title scene, right? Or at least you give them a shot at the title that signifies that they may be a world title player. On the other hand, uh, maybe it's the opposite effect, where you recognize they're a world title contender or worthy of being world title champion before you decide to put the belt on them. So it's a question of it's a question of do you want to push talent using the belt, or do you want to signify get you know signify a talent is over by giving them the belt? Leave your comment in the in the comment section below. We'll be glad to, we'd be more than happy to hear your opinion. Alrighty, no, that's good. So. Is it still a recording? Yep. Fuck! <laughs> That's going to be the opening, then. <laughs> yep. I'm DNA, be no, sure no, no, on no, the we're, editing, we're be sure reverse. to cut that and put that as the opening. No, we're going to reverse and make this a little tidbit to those who are sticking around. No. But, um... No, I think that's good. Um... I think there's nothing else you boys want to talk about. In terms of any news or anything like that that we've learned from the wrestling business today? Uh, Vince is a shit boss. <laughs> as, Look, man. as we all know. Look, man. Vince McMahon, uh, all right, he's like 90 years old. He's gone senile. He's just sitting there. Oh, senile. <laughs> like, I imagine him in the fucking um, hospital bed saying, uh, so, Mr. McMahon, um, you go on Cena and he just responds with, What? Cena? He's here. Oh, God. Fuck's sake. Could you imagine? Very nice to John. Could you imagine 20 years from now he's still booking wrestling shows for you right. as a wrestling how many How many orphan souls did he have to suck out in order to fucking maintain <laughs> his lifespan? Nah, he, he must be like. I, I bet the Queen is like a real big WWE fan. And has sh- and has shared her her secret in immortality to Vince McMahon. Oh uh, no! Right right now, because of how competitive Vince is, he's like, I got to outlive the Queen, <laughs> so I can piss on her grave. Oh. You know, Jim Cornette adage. <laughs> Fuck's sakes! That's my last bucket list item of being a you know billionaire. This is what I think about the UK. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Brexit in my ass. <laughs> Ever since British Bulldog did that rib on me, I've had it in with all you UK folk. <laughs> That's just how competitive I am. You cross oh, me in my imagination. Oh, how long is it going to take for Triple H to finally blow his brains out? 
<laughs> what, him and Steph have both got to hold the, the gun together? You know, do that sort of mercy killing? Like that. <laughs> Sorry, Vince. It's got to be this way. Bang! <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, learned, I learned this trick from my pal, Chris. Um, Where are the smoking guns and their toy guns here, so that we can no, shut a hole? No, 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 no. Knowing Hunter, knowing Hunter, he's gonna be like, "Yo, I just need to ask you, are you ready?" No, I said, "Are you ready?" <laughs> just blows he, his fucking he just brains out. He just says that to start every fucking creative meeting, and people, you know, <laughs> they laughed when he was first in him. Now it's just getting tired, so he's like, "Ugh." <laughs> I find that tiresome. Oh god. Or we'll just wait until WWE goes to Saudi Arabia next time and maybe then the fucking plane gets uh, you know, sabotaged and then oops, it just you know, you know I, I, I could see the Saudis do that's a fucking annoying thing. Like they go to this, they go to this private plane to like, you know, unscrew some of the wheel a bit. No, you know you know what it is. No, the Saudi prince would have like his personal guards get ready to execute Vince McMahon because For no yeah no because uh like Rowdy Roddy Piper and Yokozuna weren't in Crown Jewel even though <laughs> they were dead. Vince McMahon will get shot in the back of the head. The bullets will bounce off and kill the two guards. The plane will go <laughs> down. He'll come walking out of the fucking wreckage with a suit of armor made out of the plane parts. And and in and in the plane you have uh, Mr. Perfect, Brock Lesnar, Ric Flair having a fight as well. Oh my fucking god! No, not two point <laughs> The plane ride from hell two point oh. Jesus. Uh, so I, don't, I don't think he can do uh, Mr. Perfect because unfortunately he's passed on, but he could do Ric Flair and fucking uh, Brock. Fucking hell. Ric Flair is going to keep the plane of a light by whipping out his cock and doing a fucking helicopter thing. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, guys! I'm going to keep this plane in the air! Yeah, he's like, did, did, did you think that's how the first plane crash is involved in happened? He's just swinging it around and hit yeah. the pilot. He's just like, he's just like talking. And he's like, don't you worry. I'm going to make sure that this plane keeps up flying. Woo! <laughs> just... I'm the nature boy. <laughs> and air, I, I've owned the air. Woo! <laughs> We're flying to Space Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> he drives to literal space. <laughs> oh, fuck's sakes. Alrighty then. Well, I think that's a good time to close things off, don't you say? Don't you think, Dana? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us here on the No Cell Podcast. Come back for more podcast or less podcast, whatever your pleasure is. Anyway, we're out. I'm DNA. I'm Omega. Hey. Now I'm Kingdom. Suck my balls. That's all. We'll catch you next time. Peace. Bye. What's going on everybody? This is your boy DNA. Thanks for watching the No Cell Podcast. We appreciate your time. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on that notification bell. You can follow us at our Twitter at X No Cell Podcast X. Be sure to check out the artist that made our thumbnail, Don Guero Labs. You can find him on Instagram. Twitter and Twitch. Just search Don Guero Labs. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the No Cell Podcast.